Dear distinguished guests, colleagues, and students, welcome to the first William J. Perry Lecture held in conjunction with IWA GSIS Distinguished Global Lecture Series. The William J. Perry Lecture Series is supported by the Pacific Century Institute, and we are honored to be joined by its co-founder, Spencer Kim, Chairman and CEO of CBOL Corporation. Our speaker today is Janet Napolitano, former Secretary of Homeland Security, former President of the University of California System, and former Governor of Arizona. As such, she is eminently qualified to share with us her wisdom on preparing to lead today's challenges for tomorrow's leaders. I'm sure that Secretary Napolitano's insights will be particularly welcomed by our students, who will, of course, be the women leaders of tomorrow. IWA President and former GSIS Dean, and Mi Kim, will speak further to Secretary Napolitano's eminent achievements uh, after this segment. The lecture and discussion will be moderated by Prof Professor G.A. Son, invited professor at IWA GSIS and senior communications consultant for the Career Green Growth Trust Fund. We will, of course, welcome questions from our audience in the final section of today's proceedings. So I'll now hand over to President Kim for her welcoming remarks. Dear students of IHWA, uh, Ms. Janet and Napolitano, uh, Mr. Spencer Kim, is esteemed guest professors, staff and alumni, and everyone who is joining us today online as well as here. Welcome to the first William J. Perry Lecture Series uh, to be offered at IHWA, co-sponsored and co-organized by the Graduate School of International Studies as part of its Distinguished Global Lecture Series. The William J. Perry Lecture Series began in 2016, named after William James Perry, former Secretary of Defense of the United States. It annually brings outstanding professionals uh, from various fields who have answered their country's call to government service and return to their chosen professor professions afterward. The globally renowned speakers have shared their experiences in government and provided insights on global challenges and leadership. The Pacific Century Institute, a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles, focusing on building bridges between countries and people, sponsored this esteemed lecture series to provide cross-cultural communication and nurture future leaders. I'm particularly grateful to Mr. Spencer H. Kim, co-founder of PCI, who brought the William J. Perry Lecture Series to IHWA in order to help support future leaders, and in particular women, who aspire to serve their nation and the world. It is a distinct honor and privilege for me to introduce the William J. Perry Lecture Series honorary speaker, Ms. Janet Ann Napolitano. She graduated from Santa Clara University in California as a valedictorian. She studied at the London School of Economics and the University of Virginia Law School. Ms. Napolitano appears to have had several lives. First, she was a lawyer in Phoenix, Arizona. Second, in 1993, she was appointed the U.S. Attorney for Arizona by President Clinton. Third, she starts running for public office. I don't know why. In 1998, she was elected as the, as the Attorney General of Arizona. In 2002, she was elected the governor of Arizona. As governor, she supported educational initiatives, including voluntary full-day kindergarten, a literacy program for all residents, an increase in teacher salaries, and investments in higher education, education, higher education. Fourth, in 2009, President Obama asked her to serve as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Homeland Security is a multifaceted and diverse government body that supervises securing the U.S. border and immigration, federal disaster relief under FEMA, to name a few. 
During her tenure as the secretary, she led the response to the 2009 flu pandemic, persuaded Congress to fund an increase in technology and infrastructure along the southern border with Mexico, strengthened anti-terrorism security in the Canadian border, introduced the TSA pre-check and global entry programs. I'm, I'm running out of breath, literally. Created the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivers, or DACA, system, and advocated for comprehensive immigration reform. And then fifth, she had another turn in her career. From 2013 to 2020, Ms. Napolitano was appointed as the president of the University of California system. Presiding over 10 campuses, including UCLA and UC Berkeley, and five medical centers and three national labs, she was the first woman to lead in this position. During her tenure, she took particular interest in reforming UC's sexual harassment and sexual assault policies with training, education, and support services. Now in these five phases in her career, lawyer, attorney general, and governor of Arizona, secretary of Homeland Security, and most recently president of the University of California system, she was often the first woman to serve in these leadership roles. Acknowledging her leadership, Forbes ranked her as the world eighth most powerful woman in 2013. But I'm most amazed at the diversity of leadership roles she had played in her life. One of her five careers are enough to introduce five speakers respectively, but all five leaders rolled into one person is truly outstanding. And she happens to be a woman. Hey. Uh, <laughs> What more can you ask for? I'm so thrilled to hear her speak and address the Iwa community, and in particular, our students, who will no doubt be inspired by her. Before I ask Ms. Napolitano to the stage, I would like to thank the Pacific Century Institute for sponsoring this event, Dean Brendan Howe, Professor Jia Son of the Graduate School of International Studies, and many staff members for preparing uh, today's lecture. In recognition of our outstanding career in both political and academic fields, we are honored to invite Ms. Janet Napolitano to deliver her speech entitled, Preparing to Lead, Today's Challenges for Tomorrow's Leaders. Please welcome Ms. Janet Napolitano to the podium with a warm round of applause. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I want to uh, thank the, uh, those who invited me here to deliver the William J. Perry lecture, uh, particularly uh, Spencer Kim, uh, uh, who we have worked with for, uh, since before the pandemic started in terms of trying to uh, get the lecture scheduled, et cetera, and our persistence has paid off and has brought me to this lovely uh, campus to speak with you today. Um, I, I thought it would be great to be with you to share a few of my thoughts on what transformational leadership can mean and a little bit about how I came to be standing before you today. I will say it is amazing how much and how quickly things change. Now, Arizona, which is located in the southwestern United States, is the 14th largest state with a population of seven and a half million people. Historically, it has been dominated by Republicans, although it has tended more Democratic in recent years and voted for Joe Biden in 2020. But back in 2002, when I ran my first campaign for governor of Arizona, 
I was asked a question by a reporter when we were just launching the race. Now, although I'd been the U.S. Attorney and Attorney General, I was a definite underdog running as a Democrat. And this may have been my very first interview as a gubernatorial candidate. But the reporter didn't ask about my qualifications or the odds about my election. Instead, his very first question was, Janet, are you planning to run for governor as a woman? Think about that a moment. I thought about it a moment and I said, well, you know, I'm not sure I have much of a choice. Now the room broke out in laughter, but I actually wasn't trying to be glib or funny. Of course I knew what he was asking. He was asking whether I intended to make gender and issues related to gender an issue in the campaign. In retrospect, it was kind of funny because no men running for office are ever asked whether they intend to run as a man. And I'm pretty sure today fewer women get questions like that. But back in 2002, 20 years ago, things were different. We have really come a long way where gender equity in our society is concerned, but we still have a lot of work to do. So I'm here today to speak with you a little bit about my experience, what it has meant to be a woman in leadership when, with some of the roles I have had the honor of holding, being a female was pretty unusual. And as was noted in the introduction, in most cases, I was the first. Um, but I wanna step back a moment and just say that I never sat around thinking to myself, what does it mean that I'm a woman in this job? I didn't really muse about my place in history or benchmark my gender against the historical backdrop of growing equality. Now, naturally, gender equality is important to me. But I viewed my job as jobs, the jobs that I'd been elected or appointed to do, and that I had a real responsibility to the public to do right by them and to them first. So what I really thought about in the public roles I held, and also the private ones, was how to get the work done right how to improve public education for children, how to improve a state's health care system, how to effectively prosecute violators of the law, how to secure the homeland and prevent a terrorist attack against our nation, how to improve border management and immigration enforcement, how to take a gigantic university system and make it operate more efficiently and effectively while delivering best-in-class education and research. Because doing all of those things and many more is what people expected me to do. And I thought that focusing on the job at hand was the best way to do right by all people rather than musing about my gender or how it oriented me to a position. Now with all of that as backdrop, I'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities that women face along the path of their career trajectories, along your paths in your career trajectories. So let me start by talking a bit about my own journey how I got into public life and why I've stayed in it for the better part of 30 years. Now, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico in a very traditional family. My father was the dean of the medical school at the University of New Mexico, and my mother was a homemaker staying home with my brother, my sister, and myself. I left New Mexico to go to Santa Clara University in California for my undergraduate degree and I had the honor of graduating as its first female valedictorian. 
That moment would indeed represent the first of what would become several firsts over the course of my career. But again, I didn't dwell in my mind on being the first female valedictorian, um, but I thought actually it was pretty neat since my dad had gone to Santa Clara and he hadn't graduated as valedictorian. I, went, I then went on to law school at the University of Virginia and upon graduating, earned a clerkship on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. In the United States, the Circuit Court of Appeals is the court that sits right below the U.S. Supreme Court, so clerkships there are highly valued. And the judge who hired me was named Mary Schroeder. She happened to be from Phoenix, Arizona, and that is where her chambers were, her chambers meaning her offices. So having never been to Phoenix, I loaded up my Honda hatchback with all of my worldly possessions and my, my bike on, my ba on the back, the skis along the roof, um, and drove across the country from Virginia back to the American Southwest. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about Phoenix, it is aptly named because it is really a place that rose from the ashes of the extreme desert heat into a sprawling metropolis that is now the fifth largest city in the United States. But, but for the advent of the air conditioner, I'm not sure Phoenix would have turned into what it is today because it is so hot in the summer there that you can literally fry an egg on the sidewalk. And I know, I've tried it. In the middle of the summer heat, however, is exactly when I arrived in my, to my new home. And as I saw the waves of heat coming up off of the desert floor, I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm glad this clerkship is only for a year because I'm going to get right out of here after that year is over. Boy, was I wrong. Because in the end, I fell in love with Arizona, and to some degree, I still consider it to be my home today. And that is due in no small part to the tight-knit nature of the legal community there, a community I suddenly found myself in and one in which I realized I could thrive. Judge Schroeder, who was also the chief judge of the circuit, and just to explain a moment, in the United States you have the Supreme Court, and then the country is divided into 13 regional circuits, um, courts of appeals, and Arizona is in the Ninth Circuit, and the headquarters of the Ninth Circuit are in San Francisco. Um, and she became its chief judge. But Judge Schroeder was an incredible woman, a mentor, and a lifelong friend. And she herself was part of the opening of the legal profession to women. Before becoming a judge, she had been the first female partner in a law firm in Phoenix. And that was in the 1970s, the late 1970s. So like I said, Gender equity has come a long way in recent years, but the fact that in a major city like Phoenix, no women were partners in law firms until the late 1970s really shows how far we had to go. In fact, when Sandra Day O'Connor, who became the first woman on the US Supreme Court, moved to Phoenix in the late 1950s, no law firm would hire her due to her gender. Those hiring partners at that, at that law firm, at those law firms, are pretty embarrassed today that they didn't hire the woman who would become the first woman justice of the US Supreme Court. And today in Phoenix, 40% of law firm partners are women, are women. And those numbers have changed in part because of the strong mentorship of young female lawyers by people like Judge Mary Schroeder. She mentored me and she mentored many others. I went on to practice at the same firm she left to become a judge and I became a partner there as well. 
So as it relates to overcoming the gender gap and accomplishing gender equity, I am a big believer in the role that mentors can play. Young women need to believe in themselves to be successful, but they also need more experienced women and men to help them find their confidence. Now, another person who really mentored me was a, an attorney named John Frank. John was a very famous constitutional lawyer. He had actually litigated a case called Miranda versus Arizona in which the Supreme Court found that people must be read their rights before being questioned by authorities. If you don't know that case, if you don't know or haven't heard the phrase Miranda warnings, you need only watch an American movie or television show. You will hear these words. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Those are known as the Miranda warnings. And those rights, usually described by an arresting officer of the law, came from the Miranda versus Arizona decision that John Frank litigated. Anyway, it was John who first encouraged me to go into politics. And it was an experience that I had with him that really motivated me to run for office myself. You see, as a relatively young lawyer, John asked me to work with him in representing a woman named Anita Hill when she was testifying before the United States Senate Judiciary Committee during the confirmation hearings of Supreme Court nominee and now Justice Clarence Thomas. Anita had worked for Clarence Thomas, and when her allegations about his inappropriate behavior towards her became public, a firestorm arose, causing the Judiciary Committee to schedule an emergency hearing. This was well before the Me Too movement, before serious discussions about gender equity and sexual harassment in the workplace had happened, Honestly, before there'd ever been any serious public discussion about gender and behavior in the workplace. Anita Hill was really the first to bring to the fore issues about sexual harassment and gender-based workplace behavior to the national stage. The hearing was televised, and believe me, everyone in the United States watched it. And there I was, right in the middle, helping represent her before the U.S. Senate. I had thought about getting into public life before representing Anita Hill, but sitting there in the legal team in front of then-Senator, now President Biden, as he presided over the committee hearing, a committee comprised of all upper-middle-aged or elderly white men, um, I knew that at some point I wanted to enter that arena. Anita Hill's strength in speaking her truth to the committee about Thomas's behavior toward her, coupled with the importance of the discussion about disparate treatment of a woman by a man who would soon be a Supreme Court justice, was the motivation and inspiration I needed to launch my own career in public service. And after the hearings were concluded and we made our way back to Arizona, I started the process of examining what I might want to do in politics. Now, planning and picking the right moment to make a move is something I have come to believe is essential. It's essential for anyone looking to get into political life but particularly for women. Uh, in my experience, men always think every moment is their time to run. They're not quite as particular. But women deliberate, plan, and often question themselves, uh, sometimes and oftentimes for no good reason. For me, picking targets of opportunity that were achievable and attainable yet still entirely ambitious, became the way I started to put together the building blocks of a public service career. 
And as I said, after Anita Hill, I began planning. I considered running against Arizona's incumbent Democratic U.S. Senator, but I decided it was neither a warranted race nor something that was realistic. And about the same time, Bill Clinton was elected President of the United States. And he was interested in appointing women to non-traditional roles. I was asked if I might be interested in serving as the United States Attorney for Arizona. The U.S. Attorney is the chief federal prosecutor of a district. Uh, it's an appointed position that also requires confirmation by the U.S. Senate. I said yes, and my career then took off. I was appointed by President Clinton as just the second female U.S. Attorney in Arizona history and subsequently confirmed by the U.S. Senate. By then, I was 35. Now, I'd been a partner at a law firm. I'd managed a few people, but this was a whole new thing. For example, my previous legal practice was confined to civil litigation, and now I was running an office of more than 100 career criminal prosecutors, having never myself ever handled a criminal case. And now I was not just managing the office, but I was dealing with the White House, the Department of Ju uh, Justice, and the office itself was one of Arizona's largest law firms. Um, but among the many things I learned while serving as U.S. Attorney is that if you take up the challenge, you can learn fast and you can learn how to do the job. Uh, too often, I think, women looking to get into public service question their qualifications for the role they're considering. Um, in fact, a recent study found that female candidates for office are 60% more likely to question their own qualifications than male candidates are. But my rule of thumb is if you're thinking about doing something, it's a good bet you are either qualified to do it or you can learn to be qualified to do it. So you just go for it. And that's precisely what I did when I decided to run for attorney general. Now, there is a big difference between holding an appointed position and running for office. Uh, but I had a political itch, and I was turning 40. I was about to turn 40. And the attorney general was an open seat, meaning that the incumbent could not run again. And I realized that I didn't want to be, you know, in my 80s, in my rocking chair, saying woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, the worst thing that could happen is that I would lose, in which case I would return to my old law firm. But deciding to run for office means taking a risk. And sometimes I fear women are too timid in taking that risk. No woman in Arizona history had held the job as attorney general, uh, but I had been practicing federal criminal law for five years. I figured I would be a pretty good fit for the state's top law enforcement role. So I resigned my position as U.S. attorney and began a two-year campaign to be elected attorney general. As a woman and as a Democrat, no one gave me much of a chance, but I worked hard and I discovered that I liked campaigning. I really enjoyed it. And I encourage some of you who have, or may have a little bit of a political itch uh, to get out there, give it a try. Because in the end, as is obvious, we succeeded, I was elected. Uh, and in addition to me winning that year, something else interesting happened. Arizona voters elected five women to the state's top five constitutional offices in 1998. The first time ever in U.S. history, the top five jobs from governor all the way down to superintendent of public instruction were all held by women. The first time ever in any state. Time Magazine dubbed us the Fab Five. And we were sworn in together by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, an Arizonan. 
So that made our inauguration so very special. And I must say, it was pretty, pretty fabulous to have an all-female lineup running the state, even if the other four were Republicans and I was the lone Democrat. It led to a very collaborative environment and to a productive four years for the state. But not so productive that I didn't think I should run for governor after my first term as attorney general. And once again, timing was important because the governor could not run again and the governorship would be an open seat. Uh, and it, there was much that I thought could be improved in Arizona. So after four years of prosecuting criminals, protecting the state's elderly population from fraud and abuse, and leading some of the most high impact litigation in the country, I knew I was ready to lead the state as governor. So run for governor, I did. Asked whether I was running for governor as a woman, I was. And when as a woman, I did. <laughs> Which made me the first woman in history to succeed another woman as governor of a state and the first woman in US history to succeed from US attorney to attorney general to governor. But as I said earlier, I didn't come to governing just as a woman. I came to it to do the best I could for everyone in our state. And I think my record speaks to that. We created a whole new grade in public education with free full day kindergarten for every child, created 200,000 new jobs, we created the state's most robust rainy day fund in its history. We built a new medical school in Phoenix. We made record investments in higher education. We created a new bioscience corridor. We had six straight balanced budgets, one for each year I was in office. Uh, and we helped make Arizona one of the nation's leading sports and tourism destinations. And along the way, I was reelected governor by the widest margin in the state's history, winning not just every county, but every legislative district when I had won it by just one percentage point when I ran four years earlier. And I was elected by my peers to serve as the first female chair of the National Governors Association. I, I think that record, record of governance and, and the margin of my reelection showed that people, and not only women, but voters themselves thought we were doing a pretty good job for them. And that's what always we kept in mind. So it was with a certain degree of bittersweetness that I chose to leave in the middle of my second term as governor to become the Secretary of Homeland Security after President Barack Obama asked me to serve in that role. I was the third Secretary of Homeland Security, the first woman to hold that position. And so I went from governing a state in the Rocky Mountain West to preventing terrorism, securing our nation's borders, overseeing the nation's cybersecurity, and responding to threats of all kinds to the homeland. Now, the law enforcement community in the United States, as I believe in every country, is disproportionately male. And I found myself as the first female Secretary of Homeland Security presiding over a workforce that had not progressed as quickly as others in the United States with respect to gender. DHS is a vast agency with more than 250,000 employees and another 150,000 contractors located in 42 buildings in Washington, D.C. alone with an annual budget of nearly $60 billion. Not to mention having a presence in all 50 states and more than 120 countries around the globe, including here in South Korea. Uh, it's an, also an agency that deals with everything difficult and you know you're doing the job when nothing bad happens. It's the ultimate definition of having to prove a negative every day because if DHS makes a mistake, it could mean a loss of life or at least a bad headline. I'm often asked how I stayed so long in the job uh, because in addition to being the agency's first female secretary, I am to this day its longest serving. 
Uh, and the answer is with a great deal of support from an incredible workforce, key staff, and friends and family. And it also was an extraordinary honor to be in the cabinet of President Barack Obama, who had assembled the most qualified, most diverse, and most experienced cabinet in recent U.S. history. The cabinet truly looked like America, both from a racial and gender perspective, and it was sensitive to ensuring that it operated in a thoughtful and inclusive manner. Now, leading DHS, as I mentioned, was a challenge, to say the least. The department, for those of you who don't really know it, was formed after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Congress, at the time, decided to combine 23 different agencies under one roof and gave it myriad responsibilities. Counterterrorism, border security, air, land, and sea, immigration enforcement, cybersecurity, and disaster response. The Secret Service is in the department, so we're even responsible for the president's personal safety. The department represented the largest reorganization of the federal government in the United States since the Department of Defense was created in 1947. And during my tenure there, we dealt with attacks like the Times Square and Boston Marathon bombers, we managed disaster recovery from storms like Superstorm Sandy. We coordinated the federal response to the H1N1 pandemic and the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And we expanded our security alliances around the world, including here in South Korea. We created a special program for undocumented youths brought to the United States as children to protect them from deportation. We created a program to expedite airport screening, both for international and domestic travel. Known as Global Entry and TSA PreCheck, they are extremely popular. So again, it was bittersweet when I decided to step down as secretary to become president of the University of California, where for yet another time, I was the first woman, the first female president after 19 men had led it before me. It's the nation's largest public research university system. Ten, ten research one institutions, 230,000 students, and a budget north of 30 billion a year. It was not the biggest thing I'd ever managed, but it was close. And the level of complexity and diversity to the system made the task of integrating multiple campuses all the more of a challenge. The University of California uses a shared governance model where faculty and the administration have an equal say in how it is run. And when you add the board of regents, essentially a board of directors, the legislature and the governor on top of all of that, you have quite a thing to behold. Some of the things that um, I think have helped me uh, along, along the way uh, have been uh, a way of setting priorities as I navigated student needs with faculty requirements, with legislative, regional, and gubernatorial priorities. I really had to be like a diplomat in the middle of competing interests, kind of the Secretary of State of the University of California, as it were. I spent seven years in that role until last year when I stepped down to become a professor at UC Berkeley and to found the organization I now run, the Center for Security and Politics at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley. The center brings together world-renowned academics with industry-leading practitioners to address some of the biggest challenges we face in security and politics today. Things like disinformation on social media, that leads to institutional decay, political misdirection, and interference with our democratic processes. We're tackling climate change and its effect on security. And we're looking at technology writ large and where it may lead us and whether it is leading us or we're leading it, et cetera. Now, you are all here because you're the future women leaders of South Korea and indeed the world. 
And let me say this as clearly as I can to you, because I think I'm living proof of it. Dream big. Dream big. Pick a goal and then aim higher, because you can do anything you set your mind to. You can be anyone you want to be. Listen to yourself and what you want. Find your passion. And then have the confidence to go out and pursue it. Along the way, accept mentorship from those willing to offer it. Make timely, thoughtful, and strategic decisions about when and why you're making a career choice or a career move. But know that if you're thinking about doing something, you can do it. There is no special sauce to being successful and to being a woman in leadership other than you. You're the special sauce. And your will, know-how, and strength will help you achieve your goals. Let yourself be who you are, and you will find satisfaction and professional success. I may have been the first in a number of roles, but I will certainly not be the last. And that, my friends, is why I have the privilege of being with you this afternoon. So go out and just do it. Thank you very much.